Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. Uh, today we're going on and looking at how a cavity creates Gaussian beams. And just to remind you of where we are here, we're talking about the cavity, and we've already covered cavity stability, so we know how to make a cavity that traps rays. We've already covered beam propagation, so we know if we know the parameters of a Gaussian beam, we'll know how to calculate it anywhere in space, even if it goes through optical systems, at least in simple cases. And we're working on beam formation in the cavity. And we learned last time that the cavity mirrors, um, and so we're just basically blowing this up in here. The cavity mirrors form a Gaussian beam, and the radius of curvature of the beam at the mirrors has to match the surface of the mirrors. Um, and we found two simple cases, one for a planar cavity, where we know the waist, W0, is going to be located right at the flat mirror, because we know where, that's where the radii of curvature are positive, and we can solve that case analytically in a more complicated case with two curved mirrors. Uh, today we're going to look at a different case, and we're going to say, what's going to happen if we put something inside this cavity? Uh, for example, we put in some kind of gain medium right here. It's going to have some perturbing effect on the beam, um, and this gain medium is essentially what's going to create the light for our laser, and it's pictured essentially right there, and this is an absolute necessity to create a laser, but it's going to create havoc with our Gaussian beam. Well, it turns out there's a numerical method we can solve this that avoids the indignity of going to uh, solving lots of algebraic equations. That's going to be discussed here on the next slide. So again, we go back to our Q parameter, our ABCD matrix for the Gaussian beam, as we covered in Chapter 3, and this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we remember that the only surviving modes are going to have radii of curvature that match the mirrors. And this, remember, is because if after one round trip the modes add up out of phase, the overall amplitude of the beam is going to be much smaller than if all the modes add up in phase. And so the cavity essentially uh, selects uh, Gaussian beams that are in phase across the entire surface of the mirror after one round trip. And we know, essentially, that after making one round trip, the Q parameter has to be the same, because the Q parameter essentially gives us the phase of the Gaussian beam. And so this equation right here um, is our matching condition for waves being in phase after one round trip. And in this case, all we have to do is plug in some values, and the book goes through how you derive essentially a, a quadratic equation for Q uh, in terms of your ABCD parameters. And remember, once you have the Q parameter, um, at any point in space, you're able to look at the real part and get out the radius of curvature of the beam and the imaginary part, and from that extract the waste radius at any point Z within the cavity. And remember, I can't stress this enough, the light face fronts match the mirrors. You choose the mirrors to create the beam you want rather than having to match the mirrors to the beam that already exists within the cavity. So let's see how this, uh, this works. It's actually quite straightforward. And Let's get there a little animation here. Essentially what happens, look what happens when we add something more complicated in the cavity and have a different ABCD matrix. Notice the beam changes, and now we're going to have to incorporate about three more matrices inside this cavity, and the algebra would become horrendous if we tried to do it the way we learned in the last mini-lecture in the last class. <laughs> so how does this work? Well, as I hinted at before, you find an expression for Q of Z by solving the quadratic equa equation. Um, this is pretty straightforward. The book's already done it, and we have terms for W of Z and R of Z in terms of the ABCD matrix at any point Z within the cavity. Um, and then we need to start the calculations. And so essentially the second step is you choose a Z value in the cavity. And just for um, random choice, we'll start right here. And then we have to calculate the ABCD matrix for this. Well, we'd have a matrix that looked like 1D01. We'd have the matrix, which I don't remember off the top of my head, for a beam entering a flat surface. We'd have another matrix here, and so on and so forth. And you'd write the ABCD matrix for the cavity starting at this particular point. Um, and so we've chosen a Z value. We've calculated the ABCD matrix. Once we have the ABCD matrix, we go ahead and we calculate W of Z and R of Z using these two equations right here, which are given in equation 5.3.6 and 5.3.7 in your book. And then the next thing we're going to do is, once we've finished with all of that, we're going to go to the next Z value and increment 
with our z-value, recalculate the matrix, which is going to have changed going through all of this again. And then once we increment to the next z-value, we go back, calculate the ABCD matrix, find W of z and R of z. And this process, if you had to do it by hand, would be extraordinarily tedious. But essentially what it's going to give you is it's going to give you the waist and the radius of curvature at every point z you calculate in the cavity. And this is the type of thing you can easily write some MATLAB or other code to put into a, an iterative loop inside your computer and calculate for actually very complex cavities with all kinds of funky things inside them uh, what the beam is going to look like at any point in space. And that's essentially the iterative procedure. And with this, we really can calculate what the Gaussian beam is going to look like from just about any cavity if we write the code.